Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin, columnist and founder of DealBook, a daily business and policy report from The New York Times. After the whirlwind of news from the DealBook Summit event the other week, I sat down to talk with my colleague, Lulu Garcia Navarro, audio host with The New York Times Magazine, about what stood out for me. Here's our conversation. When you are starting these interviews, there were 12 interviews with some of the most important people in the world, live on stage, um, and you're waiting in the wings. Do you have chit-chat? I mean, what are you doing to warm up the guest? So in many cases, I get to talk to the guests prior, I mean, in the, in the moments prior. In a couple of cases, I don't just because of the sort of structure of the day. But I always think, actually, that the two or three minutes prior to an interview are more important than almost anything else that happens in an interview, in truth. And so I do, I don't want to say warm them up, but I think trying to get the guest comfortable to a place where they are going to feel able to emote, able to engage in the conversation is very important. So I do try to talk to them as much as I can, you know, in between uh, and before the interviews begin. Having said that, I try desperately to avoid talking about anything that we might be talking about because I always fear that people start to rehearse in their head. Even if you ask them even like a question that's even tangentially related to something you're going to ask later. So I like to talk about people's kids and the weather and (laughs) sports and just almost anything else. Which brings me, I think, to what you're trying to achieve when you're doing these interviews and how you craft the entire event. What is it that you are trying to get these incredibly powerful people to do when they sit down with a live conversation? I always think that the goal of these interviews is to try to let the public see the way these people think and to understand how they think about these different issues, why they think what they think. You don't have to agree with what they're saying. But trying to understand the sort of logic train in their head is sort of the goal. And to do it in an environment where oftentimes they're talking to some of the same people that are involved in some of these very consequential decisions on the other side. So people in the audience, many of our speakers, many many of the people who are sitting on the stage with me oftentimes then go and sit in the audience. You'll see Mm -hmm. Bob Iger sitting there watching uh, the vice president as we're talking about China you know, I was actually going to, about to talk to Bob Iger about China. So, and they're all seeing how each other are talking about things and thinking about things. But I think the underlying goal is, is so you can see it. And I think one of the things that's so interesting about live journalism is you get to see it in a way that's oftentimes different than in words and print. Mm. You know, oftentimes when I'm writing an article, you can talk to somebody and maybe they'll say no comment. <laughs> or they don't, they're not really giving you the answer. There's many ways to say no comment. <laughs> There's many ways to say no comment. But when you are seeing them answer the question, sometimes people don't like the, the answer or they find the answer unsatisfying. But in many ways, that is the answer. Mm. And you get to see that answer. And you get to see the equivalent of the no comment. But is the no comment an anxious no comment? Is the no comment an angry no comment? What is mm-hmm. that? You're, and so being able to sort of see all of those different sides of it, I think, are really what makes it special. I want to talk about this idea of trying to get people to reveal themselves because that's what you're saying, essentially, that you want to show this side of these people that we read about all the time, that we hang on their every word because they shape the world that we live in. And how do you as an interviewer get those moments to happen? I mean, part of it is the craft. I mean, it can't just be that they're going to sit down in front of a live audience and decide to impart personal details, right. intimate details about their life? Uh, there's a couple of things that I'm trying to do. Some of it is uh, planned and some of it's unplanned. Part of it's making them feel comfortable that they're going to get a fair shot, that they're going to uh, have an opportunity to engage in a conversation that is intended to illuminate how they think. And the other thing is hopefully lots and lots and lots of preparation. Both I spend an inordinate amount of time I mean. it. We're trying to do the math on it. It may very well be 30 plus hours a person really? where I end up both in terms of reading, um, talking to other people around them, 
um, you know, really trying to get a full piece of it. And it's a little bit like, I don't know, I imagine it may be like a lawyer. In some cases, you want to know the answer before you ask the question. Mm -hmm. And selfishly, if you're just a curious person, you also want to ask questions where the answer has never been available before. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's that and then hopefully having the ability to, to navigate and move the questions and the conversation to different places when the opportunity arises because you can plan out an interview, you know, you could plan out the 10 questions you want to ask or whatever it is, but that's sort of not really the way. First of all, I don't usually have 10 questions. I might have, frankly, like 50 or 100 questions. I did notice yeah. watching you that there's like a thick pile of paper that you're sort of flipping yes. through sometimes. So I, yeah, so in a perfect world, to be totally frank with you, I don't really like to have notes mm. at all, if possible. I like to be so in the moment that you're not really looking at the notes. Because there's, in this case, a dozen people, and it really is a sort of eight or nine hour marathon. We begin when it's very light outside at 9 a.m. and we ended, I think, at 6.30 when it was dark. I do bring lots of notes. I also use quotes and other kinds of facts as prompts. I often find that a great quote or a great little tidbit or, or note that oftentimes I need to almost read can create a great prompt for the interviewee to emote or react to. Why do you think these people come on to DealBook? Because I'm thinking about your interview with Elon Mm -hmm. and the headlines that came out of that. And I'm also thinking about last year's interview with Sam Bankman-Fried, which didn't do him any favors either. Right. And they don't need to come. There's right. no there's no requirement for them to come on this very public stage with these very other powerful people in the audience with a lot of scrutiny. What do you think is the motivating factor? I think there's two or three things that happen. Um, one is I think that a number of them have uh, been there before. They've sat in the audience. They've seen it. And... Some of them relish the opportunity to, to, to be able to speak out publicly in this kind of format and in this kind of way and hopefully have an intelligent conversation and get engaged in some oftentimes thorny and difficult stuff, but in a respectful way, um, hopefully. I think they respect the preparation that goes into it. Oftentimes, to the extent they do interviews, they're doing five or 10-minute interviews on TV. Mm. There's four or five questions. That most people are being asked questions that are very factual. Tell me this. What's happening tomorrow? What are you going to do tomorrow? What's this? How is this going to work? That, I'm, we're not, I'm, I don't want to say we're not interested in those questions, but going back to this sort of opportunity to talk about how you think. And I think people want, want to do that. And then everybody has their own idiosyncratic reason a year ago. Sam Bankman-Fried's view was if 90% of the world hates me and thinks that I'm guilty— if I can speak to people and that goes from 90% to 87%, uh, that's an improvement. <laughs> um, he, that's how he really thinks that, yeah. and that's how he really thought. So I think everybody has their own uh, reason for, for wanting to engage in, in these conversations and these interviews. We'll be right back. I want to talk about politics because political interviews, I think, are some of the hardest interviews to do because politicians are very practiced at not revealing themselves. And you had Vice President Kamala Harris, who is known as a frustrating interview. She often gives a lot of non-answers. And I thought it was interesting that you had, before that, Republican Speaker Kevin McCarthy. How did you set that up? Because it ended up that they were in conversation with each other in a way. And specifically when Kevin McCarthy was talking about President Biden's age. You just said something which I think is on the the minds of all Americans, which is the, I think you're alluding to the age of the president. I'm not alluding, he is old. (laughs) With Biden, I could not negotiate the debt ceiling with Biden. What do you mean? Explain that. It was certain decisions. He talked from cards. If it's not on the card, we're not talking about it. And then, of course, you had Kamala Harris clapping back in her own interview. With all due respect, when anyone who has had the experience that he has most recently had, I don't think he's a judge of negotiations. (laughs) 
That's the other thing that I think makes the day so interesting because you do have people who, in a way, are talking to each other. I think you get to see sort of how these different individuals react to these types of things. And I think that when they're challenged on issues or policy or just how they react to certain things, you then get to really sort of see how they react in the moment in a way that oftentimes you can't necessarily see physically when you when you read an article or or what have you. Hmm. What sense did it give you of the state of the world right now? Because one of the things when you look at sort of the totality, but specifically those two interviews, I mean, we are going into an election season. We are about to face what I think is going to be a very grueling, right. <laughs> difficult um, moment to have these two very important people sitting down with you. Um, what what insight did it give you about what we're facing and how they view this moment? So it's interesting. I think they both view it somewhat differently. And it's actually the headline we used that we are at this sort of existential moment. Part of the, that is the fact that we are in the midst of wars in Ukraine and Israel and um hopefully not in Taiwan, but we can talk about that piece of it in a moment. Mm. But then here at home with our election and then obviously within the world of business um, and given AI and some of the transformative disruptive changes that are happening. So I think it does feel existential. Um, I think for the vice president, it clearly feels that way. I mean, she, she demonstrably believes that democracy is at stake. I don't think that Kevin McCarthy believes that democracy is at stake in the next That's election. I think he thinks it's super important and super important for the direction of the country. But I don't know if he thinks it's it's existential in that way. But I, I think clearly we're at this sort of pivot point where it almost feels like everything is sort of up in the air in a way that it hasn't been in a very long time. Yeah. In that same vein, what was so interesting to me is when you talk to the president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, who doesn't give a lot of interviews to the international media. And again, there's this overriding concern about the status of her country, right. but also what it means because of the war in Ukraine, the relationship with China. And she was surprisingly sanguine. Well, I, I think the Chinese uh, leadership at this juncture is overwhelmed by its internal challenges. And my thought is that perhaps uh, this is not a time for them to consider a major invasion of Taiwan. Because of the economic uh, I mean, I was so happy that she just, she was willing to engage at all. I was surprised, you know, at one point she wasn't saying one about what she thinks is manipulation happening in the election in Taiwan. I thought actually how direct she was about that was fascinating. But her her willingness, I don't know if it's a will or allowance that she believes that China's economy is so damaged right now and so challenged that because of that, that they won't try to invade Taiwan. I never heard her say that. Uh, so directly and so publicly. Now, remember, this is the end of her second term. She's not up for re-election, uh, but it does seem that her party is likely to win. If she said that there was a remarkable risk, would that make her party's situation better or worse uh, come next year when the elections take place? I don't know. But she's also speaking to the international right. audience. And so that is what struck me because mm -hmm. you see a president, Vladimir Zelensky, yep. of Ukraine really always making the case. I mean, obviously, he's in right. an active war, but how much the international community right. needs to rally around Ukraine. And this seemed to be slightly a different message. Well, is, so I heard from a lot of sort of China watchers after this and people who, who watch her and that they were surprised, too, by the way. And they believe that she was genuine just for, for what it's worth. The view was that you normally would have taken this opportunity to speak to the Western audience and say, uh, folks, please, please, please help us as much as humanly possible. But they felt like this was the most honest <laughs> kind of answer that she could ever give because of how sanguine she was. Before we get to Elon, we're yeah. almost there. I do want to ask you about Hollywood because that was another big bucket. I mean, you had... As we've mentioned, Disney's Bob Iger. You had Warner Brothers. Uh, David Zaslav. CEO David Zaslav. And you had Shonda Rhimes, of course. Right. Um, and and so all these buckets are really interesting. The media, the Hollywood, the politics, the economy. But for me, of course, in mm. the world of media, this group felt very, very indicative of where 
the media is at right now and where Hollywood's at, which is just an enormous upheaval and real a real sense that things are are very unclear. What did you take away from from those three? I think I took away that this is an industry that is in true disruption in a way that they didn't expect or knew was coming, but maybe it's come sooner. This feels very much to me like newspapers, frankly, Mm. uh, circa circa the early aughts uh, when the real sort of transformation began. And it was a tough period, and it was a a very challenging period. It still is for, for lots of parts of the country, local newspapers and the like. But I think that the economics of the way Hollywood worked have been so upended by streaming and the unbundling of cable and social media, you know, younger people going on TikTok and wanting just their time being spent elsewhere, that the whole sort of model, if you will, is broken. And I think that they now know that, they've realized that, and the question, of course, is what do they do about it? Mm. And did you get an answer that satisfied you? Do you think they know? I guess that's I think the, the big truth question. Is, I think the truth is they don't know. I think the better assets you have, and I think Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery, of the media companies out there that have fabulous assets, are probably better positioned. But the question is, do they remain independent companies? You know, do the big tech players ultimately own them all because they're the ones who have the money? It is clear, unfortunately, as, as content creators, we're both content creators <laughs> of sorts, that there's been an abundance of content creation, probably too much content creation, too much spending on content. And so that over at least the next several years, I can't imagine we're going to be able to go on to uh, any of these streaming services. I mean, I don't know how often you go on a streaming service now and there's almost, there's too much to watch. You're not even sure what you're supposed to watch anymore. Mm. I think that'll change. We're always looking to these people, though, to have the answers. Yes. And I think, again, it struck me with the Hollywood section that they don't have the answers. They don't have the answers. Do you ever read? And that's scary. <laughs> it's totally scary. And in a way, though, I think that the whole day in these interviews, if they do what they're supposed to do, there's a, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to admit this or not. So if you ever uh, occasionally read Us Magazine, maybe you pick it up at oh, uh, friend. the supermarket of course I do. or uh, at a gym or somewhere. Anyway, there's always that page where they have pictures of these celebrities, you know, taking out the garbage or things. And they say, yeah, they're just like, like us. us. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to say all these people are just like us, but in a way they are insofar as they don't know the answers. But I think you really see that oftentimes these are intractable, challenging problems. They're problems because they don't have obvious answers, and they're just like us in that they're trying to sort through them. And I think that what you're trying to see in these interviews is hopefully back to the sort of like, how do they think? Do you think that they are capable of figuring out the answer? There are certain people, by the way, they may not have the answer, but you can sort of see the way they think insofar and go, you know what? They're better positioned than, than maybe somebody else would be to be able to figure this out. And there's other people who don't have the answer, and you can see that maybe they will never have the answer. Which brings us to Elon. You described the moment before you get on stage with Elon Musk, and I've held off on discussing this because it by far made the biggest news. I mean, mm. it was sort of overshadowed all the other wonderful interviews that you did because he was in a particular state of mind. Yep. Did you know going onto that stage that he was in a particular state of mind? What exactly did you feel was going to happen when he was coming on? I did not think that he was in that state of mind. I did not. He was uh, on the way in, relatively jovial, uh, had a, a nice energy about him. We talked about a couple sort of generic things. Uh, he was with his son and didn't seem angry or upset or anything like that. Uh, he was seemed to be excited about doing the interview. It, he didn't say he was tired. I worried he might be tired because he had just flown from Israel to Austin and then back to New York. And I thought, oh, goodness, that, you know, that's, that's he a lot. He might be low energy. That's, that's a <laughs> lot. Uh, this was the opposite. It was not low energy. It was, no. it was totally high energy. So, you know, when he, when he went down that that road, I was I was surprised. I've you know I've covered him for a long time, so I've seen moments where you know he can get to a place that's emotionally sort of dark, and so I wasn't. I don't want to say I was surprised in the moment, but I wasn't 
shocked as in, oh, my God, I cannot believe this is happening. Also, by the way, Walter Isaacson, who's written a brilliant book about him, talks about this thing called, uh, you know, demon mode, where he will sort of go into these these, these, these moments. And there are multiple Elons. I mean, I think you do see. And, I, and my goal with the interview in many ways, by the way, was to show you all of those different Elons. You were on a podcast uh, about a month ago, and you said, my mind is a storm. What did you mean by that? I mean, I, I have known you for quite some time. I think it is a bit of a storm. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, in as much as a, a weather metaphor makes sense, um, I, my mind is often feels like a like a like a very wild storm. Um, I mean, I have I have a fountain of ideas. I mean, I have more ideas than I could possibly execute. Um, I mean, I've got a, an entire design for an electric supersonic vertical takeoff jet, but I I mean, I just if I I just can't do that as well. I've had that for ten years. Um, um, I mean, there's a million things. Um, but is your storm a happy storm? No. It's not a happy storm. No. Were you trying to elicit that, this this idea of, like, what it's like to be in the mind of Elon? Oh, 100%. I think I spent weeks making notes, weeks, months, maybe the last three, two or three months before this interview, I was making notes about I had a file on my phone mm. that was called Elon. And every time I'd see something, a quote, uh, a thought that I had, I'd write it down. How are we going to, you know, how do we get here? Um, Why did you decide to do it in that moment? In that moment, I, you know, my plan was to actually go to something like that. And I sort of had a diff- handful of sort of versions of different prompts uh, related to a question, to that kind of question. But in that moment, I think I saw him, him spiraling in his head. Uh, his mind was a storm in that moment. And I think that, you know, I would see my role as, I would say, my job is to meet people where they are. It's not necessarily wh- where they should be or where I want them to be, but to meet them where they are in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I, so I think I saw him in that moment and I thought, okay, you're there. Let me meet you there and let's talk about it. Why do you think his mind was a storm in that moment? I mean, you said you could see him spiraling. Yeah. What, what do you think was going on? I think that he feels so deeply that there is this hypocrisy in the world and that he is uh, this bastion of light. That's the way he thinks of himself almost. Um, I think Walter Isaacson once described the way he thinks that Elon thinks of himself almost as like a, uh, like a Superman kind of character. And he thinks with – X, formerly Twitter, that he is trying to create this service that uh, embodies sort of free speech and the like. And he thinks that corporate America, by dropping them from the sponsors, is trying to kill him and to kill this company and to try to kill what he's trying to do. That's what he demonstrably believes. I know there's lots of people who disagree with him about that, but that's what he believes. And I think that he wanted people to see that. Interestingly, I will say, uh, and this is, uh, to me was surprising, there were a lot of people who said, oh, my God, Elon's crazy. This is absurd. How could he, you know, you're never going to get an advertiser. You're never, never going to get advertisers uh, to want to advertise on your platform if you tell everybody, if, if you start cursing at them. Right. But on the flip side, I can't tell you how many emails I get, and I don't know if they're Elon Musk fanboys or what they are, but who say, that was epic. You're a legend, Elon. That was remarkable. You're speaking truth to power. And so you could see this sort of chasm and divide, and you can also see where some of this comes from. Because, of course, we're talking about when he told Bob Iger, head of Disney, to F off. Yes. Multiple times. Multiple times. Did he think Bob Iger was in the room? Was Bob Iger in the room? I think Bob actually had left at that point. Um, But I think, I mean, there was one point he actually said, put his hand up and said, hey, Bob, if you're in the room. So I think he must have thought that Bob could have still been there. So you're sitting with Elon Musk. He's spiraling. He's saying pretty provocative things. Yep. But he seems open to totally. keeping the conversation going. I mean, what are, you, what are you thinking as an interviewer at that point? And so when do you choose, like, okay, we need to pivot from this and go somewhere else? Well, I think that in that moment, it was in the meet you where you are, let's, let's pivot. 
and, and look, I'm sure he wouldn't describe it as spiraling. I think he was actually very, I think to this day, he's very happy with what he said. I, I, I believe that. But it's so interesting. I, it's a little bit like, you know where you want to begin every conversation. I would say it's like being a pilot, I imagine. You sort of say you're going to start at JFK and you're going to end at LAX and you're probably going to stop along the way in O'Hare and maybe Denver and maybe you'll, you'll stop in Atlanta. But the weather's going to change up there and, and you've got to be willing to sort of change the flight plan. And so you sort of see the cloud and you decide, okay, I'm going to go the other way for now. Or you see the sun, I'm going to go there. Why do you think he didn't see it as a disastrous interview if the point is that he runs this company and he does need advertisers and he's clearly aggrieved by the fact that these advertisers are no longer putting their money towards the platform? So why does he then think, this is fine that I did this? Because I think, and again, I don't want to speak for him, I think that X is one component part of this larger ecosystem that he controls in SpaceX, in Tesla. By the way, SpaceX has Starlink as part of it, in Neuralink, which is, you know, what he eventually thinks will be, uh, you know, an implant in your brain. The boring company. The boring company. XAI, which is now going to be the sort of artificial intelligence engine powered in part by some of the things that go on in X. And I think he wanted people to understand the way he thinks about all of these things and that Twitter or X is just one, as I said, component part. It might even be a miniature part of the sort of larger larger thing. And he does believe in this idea of truth, what he thinks is truth. Do you think Elon actually truly doesn't care that people hate him? Does anyone really not care that people hate them? No, I think actually that was – but I think that's one of the great things about live – in visual journalism, when he said, I don't care if you love or hate me, I think you could very much tell that he cared deeply uh, about that. I mean, one of the things I tried to do in that moment, I don't know if you remember, is I said, you may not want to be loved or hated, but how much do you care about being trusted? Because given all of these things that you're running, you ultimately have to be trusted if people are going to be on your platform, if they're going to buy your cars, if the government's going to give SpaceX money, do they trust you ultimately? And I don't know if he actually answered that question directly, but it was clear as day, at least in my mind, that not only does he desperately want to be trusted, uh, but he desperately wants to be loved. We all do. We all do. Andrew Ross Rookin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this year's DealBook Summit podcast. This episode was produced by Evan Roberts and edited by Lane Chen. Original music by Daniel Powell. Mixed by Kelly Piclo. The rest of the DealBook events team includes Julie Zahn, Carolyn Brunel, Haley Duffy, Angela Austin, Haley Hess, Dana Pruskowski, Matt Kaiser, Yen Wei Liu. Special thanks to Sam Dolnick, Nina Lossom, Ravi Matu, Beth Weinstein, and Kate Carrington. <laughs>